Hello and welcome back to Itis Week, where we are talking all things inflammation. Uh, today, I am extremely lucky to have my good friend, Dr. Lori Kojer, with me, and we are going to talk about cystitis. <laughs> It'll be fun. It'll be fun. <laughs> How often do you get invited to talk about cystitis? <laughs> this is the first time. <laughs> well, the there you go. Maiden voyage. Maiden voyage, first for everything. Yeah. So, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was like, cystitis. Okay, well, then we're talking about inflammation of the bladder. Mm -hmm. But as I was just thinking that in my head, I went, um, yeah, well, we have, we have two bladders. So, frankly... We could be yeah. talking about uh, inflammation of the urinary bladder, but we also could be talking about gallbladder inflammation, which is not yeah. as common, but no. Um, I mean, how many ultrasounds do you get back that go, oh, there's gallbladder sludge? It's like, oh, really? <laughs> um, you know, yeah. A lot. <laughs> I, I, would say, I would say it's over 50%. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that wasn't even on my radar until I just yeah. opened my mouth to talk and it's like, oh crap, there's yeah, two bladders. But, but <laughs> we're, I, I was thinking we were focusing on the urinary bladder. Me too. Okay. But anyway, we're that's just, business. see, before we started, we said, we'll, we'll go down some path somewhere and see, I already did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, and I have a couple patients who've had their gallbladders removed, yeah. which, you know, is becoming much more common. It is, unfortunately, and I'm not exactly sure why and probably should look into that. Um, I, I don't know. Some actually had. had stones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you so, stones, but, you know, from a TCVM perspective, it's, it's the same thing. It's bladder damp heat. So it's either yeah. gallbladder or urinary bladder. Um, and that damp heat is what leads to crystal and stone formation and sludge and mm -hmm. all that stuff and inflammation. So, um, so really they could be treated the same way. So in my yin and yang book, there is a bladder damp heat, uh, recipe, which I you know, really wrote for urinary bladder stones, but frankly could be used for either. Cause now a crossover. There you go. All right. So, uh, how much cystitis do you see in your practice? Well, in my practice, remember I'm at a, I'm an integrative vet at a conventional practice right. And so I see both my people, who would be the people who are listening here, and <laughs> totally conventional. Um, just today, I saw a cat that, you're going to love this, uh, has a history of having bladder stones removed, a uh, 12-year-old cat. And of course, my conventional colleague wanted to put it on a prescription diet. This owner chose not to and is doing serial urinalysis, urinalyses, but... They give this cat a shot of Convenia for its chronic upper respiratory tract infection every three months. Ooh. Yeah. So Ooh. when it came in to me today with this history and it, it, the respiratory tract infection, she wanted antibiotics for it. Okay, you're a conventional client. We give you what you want. But it's like you're getting an oral. You're not getting Convenia. Yeah. But all her urinalysis, urinalyses, despite not being on – being on Friskies and Purina Pro Plan, uh, no crystals, which is interesting because that supposedly, is. you know, all these conventional foods lead to crystals in these cats. Well, and that's interesting because most cystitis in cats are not bacterial. Right. Most of them are idiopathic. Uh, feline idiopathic cystitis, which yeah. means we don't know what causes it. It's right. inflam inflammatory. So um, itis just means inflammation. It doesn't mean infection. Right. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, it, one of my followers sent me a book that she wrote. And she, as, as a human being, had idiopathic cystitis. Uh, yes, in her early women. in her early twenties, very very painful, and so every time she would have a flare, they would send her with um, antibiotics. Well, which, and to clarify, the respiratory tract infection is chronic, not right, the right. urinary. Right. Yeah. So, but so yeah, so urinary tract infections in cats are rarely infectious. They're usually more right. inflammatory than bacterial. Uh, for years, we've been treating them with antibiotics, but we really don't need to. Mm -hmm. So this girl kept getting treated with antibiotics. My and gosh. then uh, finally, somebody did a culture and went, oh, you don't have a bacterial problem. You have mm -hmm. idiopathic cystitis. And 
so she went through like literally torturous. Oh my um, I don't know if she's watching. Her name is Kelly Swan who wrote this book. It's a really mm-hmm. interesting book. Um, and so she went in for DMSO treatments oh. where I think it was once a week for like months. She went in and had DMSO catheterized into her bladder. <laughs> Now, DMSO is something that we – it was originally made as an industrial solvent, but we use it externally, like paint it on uh, Horse horses legs. with swollen tendons and that sort of thing. Man, I always knew when DMSO was being used yeah. in the in the large animal clinic because it has a smell that you won't forget. It and has you a, taste I garlic. Taste, I can taste it now. I can oh, taste God. it. Well, and we used to use it at Cornell IV post-colic surgery. There you go. So it's used as an anti-inflammatory. So it's an industrial solvent that we yeah. use as an anti-inflammatory. But she had to put in her bladder. She said it hurt. It burned. It was awful. And uh, so she went through all that. And it only lasted for a couple of months. And then the problem came back. Oh, geez. And so somewhere along the way, she stopped drinking diet sodas with aspartame. Oh, and stopped eating aspartame, which is a, a artificial right. sweetener, and stopped eating it. And when she cut that out of her diet, and I don't remember how that came about, but her interstitial cystitis went away. That's completely. incredible. And never came back. So it literally was this artificial sweetener, which is a chemical that was causing the cystitis. So I was reading an article earlier today on feline interstitial cystitis, and they talk about, oh, we don't know what causes it, and there's really no mm-hmm. good treatment, and we use non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and you know, we try this and try that, and nothing really works, and it comes back. You know, uh, prescription diets don't solve the problem. Mm-hmm. Well, no, they don't because right. they're usually dry kibble, and they're actually continuing to contribute to the problem. Yeah. Um, and how many, <laughs> oh, one aside with the DMSO, I worked for, with an old time practitioner who used to do a DMSO infusion on all her blocked cats. Interesting. And her blocked cats did great. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I just, I, I have to call her. Um, but the, well, and, apparently they're doing it in the, in the human and the human side, of, but this was like 20 years ago. I mean. And she, yeah, I don't know how long ago this, I don't think this girl is, is that much older now, yeah. but probably was 15 years ago. Yeah. But I, I, it's wow. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Vicki Rafter, woman ahead of her time, also huh. a farmer and horse person. And I think you get that crossover into practical yeah. knowledge there. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. But um, interesting. We had a cat that had um, transitional cell carcinoma mm-hmm. in the bladder, which is unusual for a cat. We see it a lot more in dogs than we do in cats. And we actually did neoplasine really? infusions into this cat's bladder. So we would sedate the cat. We'd put it in there and we'd uh, keep the cat lightly sedated for about a half hour or so to have it stay in the bladder. Mm-hmm. And That's um, incredible. Yeah. we d- I think we brought him in like once a month and mm-hmm. did it. Cat did great. I don't, yeah. we never, like we didn't completely get rid of the tumor, but it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's but, such but, an aggressive tumor. Yes. And so, you know, that was an owner who was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's try it. Yeah, you know, my, my cat can be the guinea pig, you know, because it was, there's nothing else you could do. You can't surgically remove most of those. No, um, no. So Not rewarding. But yeah, so that, I mean, that was a cat that presented yeah. with cystitis. It's like, oh, I've got, you know, bladder symptoms. I'm peeing a yeah. lot. I'm peeing blood. I'm straining. Uh, don't like to be picked up and touched under there. Um so well, and revisiting this cat, and I know this is something you talk about a lot. Uh, <laughs> the concentration of the urine in cats today, especially if they're eating dry food, but even if they're just doing canned, these cats are not getting enough hydration, Mm-mm. and that urine Mm-mm. is just sitting in their bladder, getting so concentrated. I'll see. I'll see specific gravities in excess. Of 1050, commonly. Oh, I, I used to see them in excess of 1070. And I'm yeah. like, this is so not, like, it, we need 1025. <laughs> like, this yeah. is so not yeah. normal. And you're right, even on the canned food. And I, I think, I, for, I mean, canned is a fairly high moisture. It's not as high moisture as a raw food would be. But um, you would think that would be enough. But the thing is, cats are not drinkers. They, right. They're desert animals. Maybe they drink once a day. I rarely 
rarely, rarely see any of our cats drink. Well, and I would also. Like I'm, I'm trying to remember if I've seen them drink. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not common. I would also question in the canned foods, the vitamin mineral premix and the quality of the ingredients, maybe also having an impact on how effective. Well, it also has all the the thickeners, yeah. and the binding agents, and I think those have a have could a, have a dehydrating have, consequence. Have an effect as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a huge problem with our kitty cats. So, you know, when we're talking cystitis, we're basically talking inflammation mm -hmm. of the bladder. So that's what the itis is, but there's, I mean, that inflammation could be caused by a tumor. It could be caused by crystals. It could be caused by stones. It could be caused by bacteria. Um, and actually there are a few weird parasites that we get in the urinary tract, mm -hmm. which I've seen those a couple of times, which is kind I've of never. Fun. Really? Never. No. <sighs> we had a uh, dogs most. I think I had, I've seen it in dogs and cats, uh -huh. which is, and I can't even remember what the intermediate host is for that one anymore. But it's really cool when you, you do your analysis and you're like, that is not supposed to mm -hmm. be in there. <laughs> and you see an egg and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> those those are kind of fun, but you know, pro probably not for the animal, but probably not. <laughs> So cystitis can be caused by so many different things um, that we can't lump them in. I think my, one of my biggest pet peeves when we see animals with cystitis is the overuse of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Like I think it's a huge problem. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's almost knee jerk. And one of the reasons I stay in a conventional practice is kind of to know what's going on. Because, you, you know, you have to to come up with alternate plans and et cetera and know what people are facing. The overuse specifically of Convenia blows me out of the water. So for, the, for anybody who doesn't know, Convenia is an injectable antibiotic, which that's the one that was made originally for like cat abscesses, right? It's a, it's a cephalosporin. And yes, yeah. you're correct. The label in It was originally made for, for cat skin abscesses, infections. so like skin issues, yeah. skin infections, exactly. And it was a great thing when it came out because who comes in with a cat abscess? Oh, that's the barn cats, the feral cats, mm -hmm. because they're out there fighting. And so that's who gets an abscess. Well, those are also the most difficult cats to right. shove something down their throat twice a day or even catch them twice a day. Um, and, you know, interestingly, uh, with all my outdoor cats, cats all the right the clouder that was born at the farm um i've had one abscess and probably between you know inner cat inner cat of my own cats because we really don't see strays coming around um and so one of them had an abscess blow out on the butt mm -hmm. and i was like oh that's cool but you know of course by the time we saw it it was yeah. already yeah already blown and so i was like all right i cleaned it up no antibiotics, mm -hmm. cat's grooming himself and Fine. no problem at all. Yeah. So even, even with, you know, yes, that's an infection, mm -hmm. but it's amazing the ability the body has to take care of things Agreed. if we don't intervene and screw it up. Agreed. Um, but yeah, Convenia was made for skin problems and People now are like, they're using I'm it not. for everything across the board. Yeah, I'm not pelling my cat. Let, yeah, let me use it for urinary tract infection. And I would have clients come in and say, well, I heard there's this injectable antibiotic I can yeah. get, and I don't have to give my cat medication. And I was always like, yeah, but it's not really meant for bladder infection. No, and it, we don't even know if we have bacteria in here. <laughs> and it can be hard on the kidneys. So why am I putting anything that's tough on the kidneys when I already have a urogenital tract? Ur a, a urinary problem. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah. no, I, mean, I, I, it's, it's just way too easy. You know, yeah, Oh, convenient. he's got, he's got a respiratory infection. That's why it's called convenient. Yeah. It's convenient. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, do a little work people. I know we're preaching to the choir here, but, um, you know, you got this animal, treat it. It's not that hard. Yeah. My, uh, uh, one of my cats had a dental recently and had a bunch of teeth pulled. And so he came home with antibiotics and I was like, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Are we, and you, I, so they gave me capsules. I probably would have asked for a liquid if they had given me what a choice, they, but they sent them home with capsules. You? Clindamycin. Yeah, pretty standard. And they sent them home with uh, like five days of clindamycin, yeah. one capsule a day. I was like, okay. 
Let me tell you, my cat would that. Uh, this is the cat that, like, if you pet him, you're going to get yourself nailed. Yeah. Like, he just turns around and whacks you because that's just who he is. And I thought, I'm going to die. Try to change. Yeah. Because he was so good. Oh, he was like, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I opened his mouth, threw it in, and he went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I never would have predicted that. So sometimes I think we give up before, yeah. before we should. Well, and I had a lady in today um, that obviously it had many health issues. And, you know, I looked at her hands. It's like, oh, I can't let this lady get scratched or bitten or anything. So, I mean, sometimes, yeah, you might get to a point where you'd give that injection. Right. But you got to, you know, people can try. But, yes, we would we would definitely prefer to use it where we know it's going to do a better job because that's why we get so much antibiotic resistance. Yeah. And, oh, my God, we're so far off track. But this is why we get so much antibiotic resistance because with a cystitis, like if you bring an animal in and it's got blood in the urine, nine times out of ten, probably 99 out of 100, mm-hmm. you're going to go home with an antibiotic even before you have your analysis results. So I I don't know about you, but I get a lot of results sent to like lab mm-hmm. work results and – you know, people will send me in a urinalysis and it'll have some crystals in it. And they're like, oh, well, he's treated for a urinary tract infection. I'm like, based on this? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, in a urinary tract infection, the pH goes up. This has a pH of five, mm-hmm. which is very low. There's no red blood cells in here. There's no white blood cells in here. Yep. But there's crystals in here. And, and you got antibiotics. Yes. Why? And why do our colleagues panic? at the sight of a crystal. The absolute <laughs> freaking panic. Oh my God, it's got crystal. I'm going well, to consign it's, it to prescription diet. Right. It's an opportunity to sell prescription diet is yeah. what it turns into, which is really funny because what I remember way back when I was a baby doctor, like my first year out of school, um, and we were, you know, because I was a new grad, I, the, the guy that I worked for at mm-hmm. the time, there was no, there were no IV catheters in the hospital. We could give sub Q fluids, but they didn't even yeah. own an IV catheter. Nobody knew how to intubate anything. Like it was so primitive, oh, very primitive. And, um, so, you know, I was like, well, we need to do lab work yeah <laughs> need to do urines and whatever. And I used to get urinalysis back and it would have some crystals mm-hmm. in it. And we were just like, yeah, that's normal to have a few. Yeah. Of, what's a big deal? And it really was not a big deal. Now, you don't want to be seeing a ton of crystals right. in there. You don't want, you know, when you get your urinalysis, if it says 100 plus crystals per field, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even 10 to 50 is a bit of a yeah. problem. But if you have a few crystals, yeah. it's just, it's not. And it's, um, I mean, maybe it means you need to make some diet tweaks, but it does not mean sentence them to a yeah. life of prescription. Well, diet. and it does mean get them on a higher moisture food, even if, even an over the counter yeah. food. Just making that switch, yeah, yep. is not huge. And interestingly, when I was reading this study on feline interstitial cystitis today, one of the things that was recommended was a higher moisture diet. This is in a traditional journal. Yeah. I was like, common sense. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Common well, sense, they're finally paying attention. Any, any, <laughs> any person listening that's had a urinary tract infection or stuff, they want you drinking like gallons of water per day. Oh, yeah. You know, drink gallons. eight glasses of water. Um, yep. You know. So, uh, so for, for cystitis um, in general, whether it's infectious or just inflammatory, mm-hmm. we want tons and tons and tons of moisture. We want things that are going to make the bladder feel better. Um, so uh, marshmallow root, um, slippery elm can even be helpful. Anything that's what we consider a mucilage mm-hmm. um, kind of makes a film. Uh, D-manos yeah. and cranberry, yeah. particularly if you have uh, infectious problems because uh, cranberry actually prevents the E. coli from sticking to the bladder wall, which is pretty amazing. Well, and usually the bacteria that are involved in bacterial cystitis infection are not high powered, super resistant bacteria. They're just run of the mill environmental, I'll right. call them for lack of a better word. A lot of so, times, yeah. So, you know, cranberry can be preventative. Yep. Yeah. I have, um, I have a couple of clients who have animals that are on the treadmill. Of Underwater treadmill? Current. Sure. You, yeah, the recurrent, no, just the treadmill of recurrent oh, UTIs. Oh, okay. 
Um, and so I think that a lot of times we don't find the underlying cause. Like mm-hmm. one, the immune system made one of them, it was an animal on chemo. Sure. So the immune system was chronically, um, being suppressed. Um, but, uh, hooded vulvas mm-hmm. in dogs, yeah. that's a huge, huge issue. Um, if you're really good about cleaning that area, like every time they pee, you can keep it under control. But I used to do a lot of vulvoplasties. Yeah. Um, no, and for those animals, and this this is one of those good reasons to wait to right. spay. Let them go through a heat so that it comes yeah, out. Yeah, I've seen some that were done pediatrically at the shelter, and you can't even find it in there in some of these dogs with the pediatric with the space. pediatric space, yeah. guys. Whatever you do, don't breed irresponsibly, but let your girls grow up. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's a huge issue. And then a lot of the cats, particularly female mm-hmm. cats that have urinary tract infections, is because they're so fat that everything is folded in. And yes, I, we used to bring these it's big skin fat. folds. Yeah, it is. We used to bring these big fat cats in and we would have to shave and clean oh. in there every few weeks just because they they're so fat they can't get around to groom themselves. Well, and- how many? Then, even if they do get around, they can't get in. How there. many have you seen <laughs> with maggots? <sighs> not to disgust any guy. Is sorry, but um, outdoor cat. Yeah, it's have, not maggot season right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna have a long. You have a longer maggot season than I do. But you know the urine. <laughs> I don't have to see him yeah, anymore. That's true too. <laughs> Smart move. Um, the uh, urine that sticks in those folds, if the cat is outdoors, uh, is very attractive to flies. And the next thing you know, you've got just maggots it's gross a disaster it's gross. a disaster so we want to control itises we want to control cystitis weight management cleanliness high moisture diet Remember? and maybe cranberry if they're yeah. prone to it for sure and and even i'll have some clients come in on cosequin for cats which glucosamine oh, cosequin for cats, is yeah. also soothing to the bladder yep yeah, very what good. do you do Almost about um, your leaky dogs, the well, hormonal incontinence or what have you? Oh, so, well, everybody knows I'm not a fan yeah. of proin. Uh, I really hate proin. I would I would actually rather use low-dose estrogen mm-hmm. every couple of weeks. We used to yeah. use a milligram of DES for our medium and large-sized dogs about every 14 days. It's just mm-hmm. a pill. Uh, they would do great on that uh, with no side effects. Um, we use, uh, there's a couple of, uh, there's a homeopathic product leaks no more mm-hmm. made by homeopet, which is pretty effective. Uh, certainly a lot of Chinese herbs. I had really good success with acupuncture and oh, herbs nice. for, um, for certainly we dogs. see a lot of recurring true infections that are ascending infection. The dog lies in the dog bed, drips urine, and bacteria, mm. find, a, find the highway yeah. up into the urethra. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if we've, if you've got an incontinent dog, you absolutely, um, and I had a few male mm-hmm. incontinent dogs, which is much less common, but becoming um, more but so. they very, it really is. And probably because of the early spay neuter that we've been doing for the past yeah. couple of decades. Um, but they used to respond really well to chiropractic. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that we can do. So if you have a dog that's leaking, first of all, you have to rule out, is there an mm-hmm. infection? Is there inflammation? Is there a partial obstruction? Is it um, diabetic you know, and it's is, simply volume overload? <laughs> right, right. Or Cushingoid, yeah. you know, do, or th- thyroid. Do we have, do we have an endocrine problem that is contributing to that? Uh, because certainly when we do the early spay neuter, we are screwing up the entire endocrine system, not, not just yeah. ovaries and testicles. Um, so once you rule out anything that could be treated with something else. Um, and it truly is just, they got spayed or neutered too early or I mean, a lot of these, it's a nerve innervation mm-hmm. problem, um, because they've got arthritis in the spine. Um, you know, the bladder is not being innervated as well. Um, so, and then we also see, uh, neurogenic bladders where it's just laying there flaccid and they're not able right. to contract it. Uh, certainly anybody who's had a, a dog with a disc disease where they become paralyzed in the back end, those guys are so prone to urinary tract infections because they they don't empty their bladder completely. Yeah. So yeah, the bladder too. just the bladder wants to do its job and be empty and fill up and be empty and you need to keep that cycle going. Right. But that's why we 
really off topic, but that's that's why we see more urinary tract infections in old mm-hmm. people because the bladder doesn't empty very well. At the more the older we get, the the less well it does that. And I think the same thing happens in our yeah. animals. Um, but that's where I find that acupuncture, chiropractic, um, herbs can really be very helpful in those situations. Definitely. So, um, so uh, I think of dogs that people put in wheelchairs or, you know, carts, whatever you want to call it. Um, those folks are so dedicated and they're emptying the dog's yeah. bladder you know, every four or six hours, it seems. I had one client who she, uh, the dog just was impossible to express and she learned how to catheterize the dog. That takes some skill. But every time you, it does, but every time you catheterize, you risk, Dragging, you know, bringing yeah. in infection, but those dogs are prone yeah. to infection anyway. So it becomes an issue. So for those who are listening, if you have an animal who is prone to cystitis, then uh, look on my TCBM blogs for damp heat mm-hmm. because we want to get rid of damp heat. So we can certainly feed for that, but also control weight, increase moisture in the mm-hmm. diet, make sure they're getting that bladder emptied. And then you can add things like glucosamine and chondroitin, cranberry, d those kinds of things to uh, uh, marshmallow root. Those kinds of things can really help decrease any inflammation and hopefully help keep infection from coming back. But remember, just because they have cystitis does not necessarily mean they have an infection. Make sure they have a true infection before starting antibiotics. And please, please don't conscript them to a lifetime of really horrible prescription diets. (laughs) So what's your take on puppy cystitis? You know, the person owner gets an eight week old puppy and they're at, they're calling you at nine and 10 weeks Puppies having accidents everywhere, um, and licking and you mention what? Oh, so you know, I didn't see too many puppies cystitis, but uh, I had a couple of golden retriever puppies that came in with urinary tract infections, like very mm-hmm. early, um, and almost always they ended up having an ectopic ureter oh, really? or some sort of anatomical abnormality. And that's why they were coming in with problems. Interesting, because uh, they seem to go in spurts, but, you know, uh-huh, right? <laughs> everything does. Um, the owners are adamant, you know, they're taking the dogs out. They describe an appropriate routine, but these puppies, and, you know, you do see a lot of white cells and such if you do a urinalysis. Well, and that's interesting because we did see a lot of uh, puppy juvenile vaginitis. vaginitis. So not necessarily um, a cystitis mm-hmm. and not necessarily a bladder problem as much as uh, yeah. just inflammatory vag. And they always outgrow it. Like I didn't treat those with antibiotics um, because they were always acting mm-hmm. fine. Um, and once they kind of either had their first heat or they got spayed one, yeah. one or the other, but they grew up and the puppy vaginitis yeah. goes away. Yeah. So I didn't, didn't oh, try, I, mean, I mean, like the by biggest, cysto, you know. I wouldn't. Right. Yeah. Then you can find out. And so like the biggest symptom with them is usually kind of a stringy yeah. mucusy yeah, exactly. discharge, especially after yeah. they pee. Um, so I was just reminded by my cohort over here, um, great study in humans. Actually, there's been quite a few humans with the idiopathic cystitis, the PEA, oh, really? the palmitoyl ethanolamide, our wonderful thing. That's good uh, to know. Works amazingly well. Um, and our PEA is just about to come back in stock. Yeah, you've been out for a while. It's been, so, oh my gosh, it finally, finally Good. arrived from overseas. It is now in this country. So uh, we should have it in the next Excellent. 10 days or so. Uh, but uh, it is amazing for cystitis. So these non-infectious, like the mm-hmm. idiopathic cystitis in cats, you still have to fix the yeah. diet. You still have to get the moisture and all those things. But PEA is an amazing uh, pain relief and anti-inflammatory for cystitis. So anybody who's had problems with in, inflammation in the bladder, recurrent infections, that sort of thing, I would absolutely recommend trying the PEA because it's it's done an amazing job. As a matter of fact, one of Gwen's friends, um, her cat blocked yeah. really badly and had to go in and had ended up having the mm-hmm. PU, uh, but he was still miserable even after that. And so we sent her over some PEA and 
Outstanding. Outstanding. <laughs> Totally solved the problem for her. Uh, and it's really funny because uh, she went away for a few days and her husband was dosing the cat and he was giving it 10 times the dose that it needed. No problem. No side no effects. Problem. Back, <laughs> back in the day, I remember we prescribed amitriptyline to these cats. Oh, yeah. And that, yep. I don't know, did it just mellow the cat out? Did it really make them feel better? Well, I mean, f I think one of the causes of idiopathic cystitis stress, in cats so is stress. Kind of like we know, we know that mental stress causes inflammation, and uh, I read one study that said that over ninety percent of indoor cats are highly oh, stressed. Oh, I believe that because they're, they they don't get to hunt and pounce and you know get their prey, and they don't get to climb, and they don't to they be don't cats. get to you know to be cats. And so it's a very stressful existence. We think that they're just hanging out on the windowsill because that's all they want to do. No, they're actually yeah. pretty dang stressed because they're not getting to do what they Ohio want to do. Ohio State's Veterinary College that has the uh, focus on cat enrichment. It's one of the mid middle. I think it's yeah, Ohio. Yeah. Loads of great yeah. information on their website. Well, and then Guelph was the one that came up with the feline pain score right. with the facial expressions. Um, so, and I, I think that we we yeah. don't take that into well, account and, nearly and enough. you know the average house is what 1800 square feet or something you know that's not much that's not much for, <laughs> for a, cat. a cat well and a lot of people with apartments have yeah, cats they because they're easier um people who work long hours have cats because they don't have to be taken yeah. out to walk um so you know we th it's it's pretty easy to I know a lot of people, they'll go away for four or five days and just have somebody right. come in and put, you know, food and water yeah. out once a day and scoop out the litter box maybe. And it's like, yeah, we think that they're solitary, but they're, they actually would kind of like well, to And just, with just the physical activity. And, you know, you've spoken <laughs> yeah. about keeping these cats at a good body weight. If you're designed to walk five miles a day or to hunt five miles a day and you're in, you know, a two bedroom apartment, it's just not happening. Exactly. And, exactly. and you're alone so, or maybe you have another cat in the house, yep. but <laughs> that you may or may not like point. or, or the other problem. <laughs> we have two in our house. They don't like the other each other. <laughs> somebody in today. Yeah. We have five cats. Okay. Picture five cats, even in a spacious house. If two yep. don't get along, that's a problem. I know. If all of ours lived in the house, oh my gosh. Yeah. And people, it's very first easy, of all, there'd be no house left. Very easy to accumulate too many cats. It is. <laughs> yeah, look at me. <laughs> well, you're, Luckily, mine you have, have a little, little more space. space and a little more natural habitat. Yeah, they, I mean they have a they have a wonderful natural environment, and it's so far has seemed very safe yeah. for them. So, anyway. So there you go, folks. PEA, if you're having problems with uh, chronic try cystitis, it. chronic in inflammation of, of the bladder, uh, certainly worth a try. We've had uh, pretty good success with it, and there are some really good human studies. I, I think it'll be a lot of years till we start seeing a lot of veterinary studies, although there are quite a few out there. So um, hopefully we'll have more. And, you know, we get lots of anecdotal mm -hmm. reports from people saying, oh, my gosh, like Gwen's cat that had the, the um, uh, mm -hmm. dental disease. Uh, genetic dental disease. He always had a painful mouth. And once she started the PEA, he was like, oh, that's no great. So it was helping his arthritis and his mouth. That's <laughs> awesome. So good stuff. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kojer. We appreciate you very much. We're very thankful that you are willing to come on and chit sure. chat about things. Happy to. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a wonderful rest of your day and week and enjoy the yes, holidays. Yes, you as well. Hopefully you stay warm. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank <Bye>. you. <laughs>